So hello, I'm Dr. Hannah Minky, and today's presentation was supposed to be on carbonate precipitation experiments in 3D printed mica models. However, that project was industry funded and was unfortunately cancelled when the world locked down and the oil price went negative. And thus, we were forced to be creative and come up with something that could be accomplished using only the data we already had and no access to a lab. And as it turns out, this study is both relevant to this session and also pretty cool. So if you're willing to stick with me today, I'll actually be presenting to you some of our exciting new research into machine learning and multi-scale imaging to upscale permeability from the nano to the Darcy scale. In the past two decades of digital rock physics, the workflow for flow modeling has typically looked something like this. First, we image a rock and measure its permeability experimentally, or maybe both, and then we build a model to try and benchmark those results. However, this method becomes much more difficult as both the amount of imaging data and the complexity of our model increases. So what if your image domain is both large and complex? You have two choices. One, you can solve the full flow model on the image, which might be computationally slow, or impossible, taking a million years or so, or two, you can find some way of simplifying either the structure via network models or the porosity permeability relationship using Cosetti Carmen so that it can be modeled at a larger scale but in the process losing both complexity and accuracy. The study provides this study provides a third option, upscaling that relationship with a combination of experimental imaging and numerical modeling, where both are used as input into machine learning tools, which can then derive upscale descriptions of that multi-scale structure for use in upscale, and by this I mean Darcy scale numerical flow predictions. The kozeny karman equation was created for the express purpose of predicting permeability from porosity for upscaling. It works well for plastics because their pore structures can be effectively represented by an even packing of elliptical beads and have a unimodal pore size distribution. However, this assumption is no longer reasonable for carbonates which have multimodal porosity structures and do not resemble simplistic beads. Carbonates contain microporosity, nanoscale structures that are wholly different from their micron-scale counterparts. We need some way of measuring and accounting for these structures across multiple scales just from a single image. Enter machine learning, which due to its ability to capture complexity on many levels is great at using features, which are just another name for those things our eyes can pick out as unique elements like a microporous grain, to quantitatively describe the structure in an image. So there are many types of machine learning, but we're going to jump right in with two feet and we're going to use decision trees. Why? Well, they're easier to use, and I don't know about you, but I'm new to this whole machine learning thing, so the simpler, the better in my book. They have low computational expense, because it's hardly worth bothering to use machine learning if the model takes longer than a brute force DNS solver. And decision trees are not a black box, like some machine learning approaches, which means you can look under the hood and start to understand what is influencing the output decisions. And last, and most importantly, we already knew it would work. Well, we knew it worked to predict permeability on a single scale. Previous studies have had success with this method before. So we thought we would give it a go for upscaling permeability in a multi-scale structure. So in order to do machine learning, we need what's called the ground truth, a data set where you have both the features, the thing you're supposed to use to predict the right answer, and the solution, the right answer. Using these models, using these, the model can compute residuals, which just, is just a fancy way of saying it needs to be able to tell with every guess it makes how far off it is from the real solution. The model can then readjust its weighting to slowly, or in the case of decision trees, extremely quickly iterate towards the solution. So in order to turn this dream into reality, we needed a ground truth imaging data set for a carbonate that had both experimentally measured permeability and numerically solved permeability for both the full core and the microporosity. Quite a big ask. Luckily, I had this exact data set, and I even had and and I'd even several months before uploaded it to the imaging archive of the British Geological Survey. So you can have this data set too, if you wish. We imaged the core of Vestiolatus limestone in the micro CT, and then a representative subsection of microporosity was identified, cut out with a laser, which was fun, and then we imaged it in the nano CT. The structure of the grains was extracted from the nano CT image, and the grain size distribution was used to create a custom porosity permeability curve for Vestiolatus limestone microporosity. The permeability of the microporous core was then benchmarked using experimental measurements and a Stokes Brinkman solver with the porosity permeability curve for microporosity. I'm not going to go into any more detail on the experimental side, but the publication is up on Earth Archive if you'd like to examine them further. Suffice to say, we have a ground truth image where we're confident in the porosity and permeability of each voxel. Next, we needed some training images. So we took the top 10% of this very large 1200 by 1200 by 6000 voxel image that had been segmented into 15 phases and we created two separate training data sets. One where we divided the volume into 30,060 cubed voxel subvolumes and one where we divided the volume into 30,120 cubed voxel subvolumes. Note that the subvolumes overlapped, so that's where we're able to get the same number of images, even though the second set had volumes that were four times as big. We then extracted features from these subvolumes using the image analysis tools in Scikit Image. This included the volume fraction of each phase and the connectivity of the volume in each orthogonal direction expressed mathematically as the first connected phase. Now, this is by far the most computationally expensive step in our workflow. Each subvolume was solved for permeability in the x, y, and z directions using this Darcy Stokes Brinkman solver in GeoChem So, without doing any machine learning yet, already the story is getting interesting. This is not the clustering line we would expect for a model with an easily understood porosity permeability relationship. Notice how the permeability can spend several orders of magnitude for a single porosity value. 
Now comes the fun part, the machine learning regression. We use the extra trees ensemble in scikit-learn to regress the 18 features against the three orthogonal permeabilities solved with Darcy Stokes Bergman. The extra randomized trees ensemble works the same way as a random forest, where the features are randomly seeded in the model as stumps, except that the features incorporated into the weighting of each split is also random, which results in less computational expense. So we use the majority of those solved permeabilities to train our regression model, but we held back a thousand for testing. So how do the machine learning results stack up against numerically solved ones? Rather well, actually. Look at that straight line. We saw a root mean squared error deviation of around 4%, which is really quite encouraging. But then we thought, OK, but how much better is this approach than the kozeny karman approach? So we fit a power law curve to the data as best we could and came up with some sort of reasonable KC model parameters. OK, we know it's going to be bad, but how bad? And as it turns out, it's pretty bad. A root mean squared error of 29% and a rather striking inability to predict the lower permeability values. OK, so back to the machine learning regression model. Now that we know how well it can predict, we wanted to delve deeper into the feature sets. Here, we looked at the root mean squared error for regressing the first 15 features, which is just information about the distribution of porosity, versus the whole feature set, which includes information about the connectivity in each direction. Unsurprisingly, the connectivity matters a lot and results in an improvement from 14 to 4 root mean squared error. We wanted to know which features are the most important features for the regression. And here we can see that the model weights the connectivity much more highly than the individual porosity volume factions, which makes sense considering the close relationship between connectivity and permeability. Then we investigated whether the size of the subvolume changed model performance. And the answer here was no, although this could change with the complexity of the rock. And finally, the question of the day, how can this machine learning regression model be used for upscaling to the DAR CTL? To answer this, we cut out three blocks of 360 cube voxels from the lower portion of the image that had not been used in the regression. We then divided each of these into both a 6x6 six six matrix of 60 cube subvolumes and a 3x3 three three matrix of 120 cube subvolumes. We then ran each 360 cube volume through four different models. In model one, we numerically solved the 360 cube volume with Darcy Stokes Bergman. In model two, we numerically solved both the 120 cube subvolumes and the 60 cube subvolumes with Darcy Stokes Bergman and used the output permeability to solve the Darcy simulation. In model three, we use the features of the 60 cubed and 120 cubed subvolumes as input into the machine learning regression, and then use the output permeability to solve a Darcy simulation. And finally, in model four, we use the porosity of the subvolumes as input into a kozeny karman model, and then use the output permeability to solve a Darcy simulation. So now we can compare the performance of the full Darcy Stokes Brinkman ground truth, model one, to the results of the three upscaling models numerical upscaling, model two, machine learning regression, model three, and upscaling using kozeny karman model, model four. Right off the bat, we can see that the highest porosity volume, volume 2, had the lowest permeability. Both machine learning and numerical models captured that behavior, while the kozeny karman model did not. Additionally, it looks like both the numerical upscaling and the machine learning regression model had about the same accuracy as the machine learning, as, as the machine learning model. However, the machine learning model was around 80 times faster. Furthermore, we can see that the 60 cube models had slightly better results than the 120 cube models. It is not clear exactly why that is, but it's a topic of future work. So to conclude, machine learning regression models can be trained to high accuracy with surprisingly little data, between 1 and 5,000 subvolumes. Note that this will probably change with different rock samples. Increasing subvolume size had little effect on model predictions. The machine learning regression model outperformed the kozeny karman model by over 20% in log space for both same-scale prediction and upscale Darcy simulations. And the machine learning regression model had similar accuracy to the full darcy stokes Brinkman simulation with a fraction of the computational cost. So where can we take this in the future? Well, we definitely want to test the limits of REV and feature extraction, and of course, this was only a single sample. And we were in the process of investigating whether we progress using only information that we would be able to see in a Darcy scale core flood. So many thanks to my colleagues and sponsors. I'd be happy to take any questions during the question or session Q&A or in the comments.